What you want, what you actually really want, is a, a teacher or a pastor who will be just as frank and candid and clear as God himself has been in the Bible. If you, no matter what church you go to or what Bible study you go to, what you should demand from the teacher in the church or in the Bible study is simply that he would re-present what God already presented in the Bible. That he would re-present today in this moment accurately what God said yesterday when he said these things. Face it. You don't really want a pastor who's smart enough to edit God, do you? You don't want a server at the restaurant who's creative enough to edit the chef. We went out to dinner last night. We went to Cheddar's on Highway 50. Very good dinner. And our server was a, a good server because she didn't edit what the kitchen prepared for us. Can you imagine if we made our order and then, you know, she went to the kitchen and the window and got it and then brought it from the kitchen and on her way to our table, she was like, well, they're probably not going to like these mashed potatoes, just blop those off the plate. Well, the, the chef probably didn't put enough paprika, so she just got some, just shakes it all over whatever we ordered and then brings it to us. You don't want a server who thinks that she's smart enough to edit what the what, what the chef put together, what you want from uh, any pastor or Bible study leader or teacher is that, uh, that he would simply bring um, what God has said in his word. And a actually all of it. Don't make it worse than God made it and also don't make it better than God. Just, just deliver it faithfully and clearly. That's what I want to do this morning from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you have the, if you have the, like the sermon notes, the little, I just popped a little outline of exactly what this passage says. In verses 1 through 3, it's talking about our fallen condition, the corruption of man. We talked about those verses last week. Then in verses 4 through 7, it talks about our Father's compassion, the condescension of God. And then in verses 8 and 9, it talks about our free conversion by grace through faith. And then finally, verse 10, our future conduct, good works. And actually, what you should demand out of me is that I, that I faithfully show that each of those four points comes directly out of this text. I mean, and I'm not a, a dancer, but I understand how one step leads to another leads to another if you're doing it right. And I, I just point out that little four-point outline because I want you to see that number one has got to lead to number two. If our condition really is that we're fallen, then our salvation really has to be by God's power and by God's grace. And if our salvation really is by God's power and by God's grace, then all three of those first ones need to lead to that fourth one that then when God's operative in us, uh, the, 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 the way we live our lives changes. So I want you to see how each of those is present and, and evident right here in this text. I want to read it together. So uh, out of reverence for God's word, I'd ask you to stand as we read scripture. We'll read verses 1 through 10 and think of how each of those four points leads from the next. We're going to read God's word. God kept you alive. One more day so you could hear him say this to you. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord God, sanctify my mind and my lips that I might teach this truth fruitfully and faithfully. And Lord God, sanctify the ears and the hearts of all those who are gathered in this place that they might receive your word faithfully and fruitfully. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen. You may be seated. So this text starts in verses 1 through 3 talking about our, our fallen condition, that we're, we're stuck in our lusts, in our flesh. We talked about those verses last week. And those lead to, have to lead to the second point, which is that if we're really in such a state, then it's going to take God's compassion to save us and that he's going to do this because of his grace, because of his mercy. This is, I want you to see all four of those steps of the outline because the apostle here moves. The apostle here moves from the wrath of God and actually, actually talking about the devil and hell and wrath to the love of God and the mercy and the grace of God. And he makes that move without any shame or embarrassment or any stumbling. And this is what you want from anybody who would teach the Bible. You want them to be as clear and as candid about these things as the Bible is. After all, you don't want some red-faced preacher who's happier to talk about hell than the Bible actually is. And you also don't want some soft, sweater-wearing preacher who edits out of the Bible what the Bible actually says about sin and wrath and hell. You simply need to see what is there because I'll tell you this, what's there is what makes the gospel good news. If we edit it, it's no longer good news. The conjunction of God's wrath with his mercy, his justice with his love, his condemnation of sin at Golgotha with his no condemnation for those who have plunged into that fountain. Those things together make the good news of the gospel so very great and good. And we see that in this passage uh, in, in a remarkable way. The first point necessitates the second. The first and the second lead to the necessity of the third, which is salvation has to be by grace through faith. That first point really sets us up, and we looked at that text last week about being dead in our trespasses and sins, our fallen condition. Because the question coming out of point one is, well, how could a dead man resurrect himself? The question coming out of point one is, how could you jump out of a hole that has no bottom? How could you get any leverage? How could you get any movement? And that's why salvation has to be by God's grace and by God's mercy. Because though we couldn't climb out, if God's merciful and gracious, He can reach His arm down and pull us out, even at such great cost to Himself. In the map of the passage, we have these three sources from which salvation comes. Well, there's one source from which salvation comes. First two words of verse four, but God, but God. It comes from God. But in the, as it were, in the geography of God's heart, there are three streams from which flow this salvation. These key words that we see in our text. If, if I edited this text 
because my goal was to make me feel good about me and make you feel good about you, then the sources from which salvation comes would be this. Well, the fact that we're saved comes from the fact that, uh, that we're, we're so lovable and so uh, valuable. Or the fact that we're saved comes from the fact that we're, we're so intelligent and so remarkable. But you see, the source of salvation is from these three streams, mercy, love, and grace. Not our mercy, God's mercy for us. Not our love for God, God's love for us. Not our graciousness to each other, but God's grace to us. We see mercy there in verse four. We see love there in verse four. And we see grace in verse five, by grace you've been saved. And in verse seven, the grace of God in the kindness of Christ Jesus. And we see grace in verse eight. These three words stand out in our passage, mercy and love and grace. And each of these three words, if you see it, has a superlative added to it. It's that the Spirit of God Himself uh, placed within the text these qualifying words, these superlative words, on top of these three awesome words, mercy and grace and love. You see how these qualifying words are, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy, verse 4, because of the great love with which He loved us. And then look at the qualifiers in verse 7. The immeasurable riches of His grace. The incomparable riches of His grace. This passage is about the greatness of the love of God. The second point of our outline, God's compassion, following from the first point of our outline, our fallen condition. Well, you see, if, if we're in such a state and God loves us anyway, His love must emanate not from our state, but his love must emanate from the fact that this is true. God is love. His love is not drawn out by our lovability as much as it is drawn out by his own nature to be love because God is who God is. We all know, and you know, I wish we didn't know this, but we all know this. We all know what it's like to be loved conditionally. I wish we didn't but we do. We know what it's like to uh, be sought after because we have something of value that someone else wants. And we all know what it's like to be passed over and forgotten because we are no longer valuable to that person who we wanted. We all know what it's like to be loved conditionally. That's not, that's not what this love is. When we see conditional we see conditional acceptance and love. We just, so, you know, we just watch the Olympics. You see that every, like, you see that in the, in the figure skating. They go out there, the lights are on them, and then they get a score based on the condition of their performance. We all see that. And it's annoying as all get out. Because the skaters, they're doing everything, and then the commentators are like, well... She almost landed that triple sow cow quadruple flip, but you know, her, her, her heel was one eighteenth of an inch off. And uh, you know, what, what the commentator should be saying is, and my rear end is sitting in a chair and I'm 38 pounds overweight and I couldn't land a, a hopscotch move, but, but you know, they, did, they didn't do that great. <laughs> The, lo the love of God, this is what Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10 say. The love of God says, she gets a 10. I don't want to see the performance. I don't even want to see it. I don't even have to see it. Because I'm, I am gifting, I am giving her or him a perfect score. I don't, even, I don't even have to watch the performance. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were undeserving and dead, he poured out the riches of his mercy and his grace upon us. You gotta get that. You walked 
just put it this way. If I could just, everybody probably walk into church feeling like a sinner. I guess that's okay because we're all sinners. But you walk into church and you feel like, well, I'm a sinner and God's not going to love me until I'm no longer a sinner. And I can't have that. This is what the Bible says. Very confusing. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is what the Bible says. It's not very confusing. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Maybe this is why God brought you here in this service in this hour right now. Because the Bible says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There is no word between save and sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There's no qualifying word there. Do you hear me? The Bible does not say Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners who aren't that bad as the other sinners. It doesn't say Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners who are lovable enough or desirable enough or not too far gone enough or who are willing to clean up their act enough. It simply says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not having anything to do with the state and, and the willingness of the sinners to get ready to be saved, but because Christ is such a generous Savior. This is the good news of the gospel. He saves sinners by his grace, by his love, by his mercy. We have these three marvelous words here, love and mercy and grace. Mercy means not giving us what we deserve. It means holding back judgment and condemnation. Grace means giving us what we don't deserve, unmerited kindness and favor. And don't miss what it says in verse 4. God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. The storehouse of God's mercy runs over and is not depleted. Listen, you may wish you may wish to sin so much that you can drain God's mercy dry. You may wish to sin so much that you can drain God's mercy dry. And this cannot be done because there is more mercy in Jesus Christ than there is sin in you because you are only you. And He is Christ Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. God is rich in mercy, and He has such great love with which He loved us, undeserving and unlovely as we are, that even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. How is this? How does this happen? Well, you get a clue there in verse 5 when it says, He made us alive together with Christ. It has to do with being with Christ. How is this salvation ours? It's ours if we're in Christ. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, the first thing that he says about them, he says in chapter 1, verse 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. And then we have that same locative phrase in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ. In Christ Jesus, in Christ. Being, receiving the mercy and love of God has to do with being in Christ Jesus. In fact, this, this whole paragraph that we're in in chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 is really a, it's the fulfillment of Paul's prayer at the end of chapter 1. Look at, the, look at the end of chapter 1. He says, this is why I'm praying for you, he says in verse 15 of chapter 1. He says, I give thanks for you in verse 16. And he says, this is what I'm praying for you. The eyes of your heart will be enlightened. And uh, he says, look at verse 19 of chapter 1. Verse 19 of chapter 1. This is what I pray for you. That the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. 
I want you to see that there because verse 19 says this. Uh, I'm praying for you to know God's power. Just like a pastor, just like I would pray for you. Verse 19 says, this is what I want you to experience and know. I want you to experience and know the power of God. Verse 20 is how you know that. So you're with me there. I'm praying that you will know and experience the power of God. And then verse 20 says, the power of God that was operative in Christ. Huh? Well, how am I to know and experience it if it was operating in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead and when he seated Christ through the ascension in the heavenly places? Well, the way that works is that we only know the power of God if we're in Christ. And so from verses 19 and 20 of chapter 1, we move ahead to verses 4 through 6 of chapter 2. When we were dead in our trespasses, verse 5, he made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved. Chapter 2, verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in chapter 1, verse 20, His power was working in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead and seated Christ at his right hand. In chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, his power is working in us when he raised us with Christ and he seated us with Christ. The three withs in verses 5 and 6 are so important. At least in this translation, ESV translation, the word with shows up three times. Uh, Verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ verse 6, and raised us up with him, and then verse 6, the second half, and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Made us alive with Christ, raised us with Christ, made us to sit down with Christ in the heavenly places. These three refer to three successive events in the life of Christ. And now, they're events in our lives if we are in Christ. This is what Christ has done for us. This is what we have in Him. Well, why did God raise Christ? Well, God had to raise Christ from the dead. Again, very complicated, very confusing. God had to raise Christ from the dead because Christ died. Well, why would Christ, the Lord of life, die? Christ, the Lord of life, who didn't deserve to die, would die in the place of those who deserved death. It starts to show up in chapter 1, verse 7. In chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Sometimes we need to slow down and realize that the the Bible sounds strange. Why... Every now and then someone will ask me, what what is with all this talk about blood? Your church sings about blood, a fountain filled with blood? Where's that? And then verse 7 says, we're redeemed through through his blood. I mean, if we're honest, we'd say, you know, every now and then it almost sounds a little vampirish. What's with all the blood? Why does it say it like that? Leviticus says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without the, with, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. This Old Testament principle is repeated in Hebrews and in the Gospel of John. Why all this talk about the blood? To someone on the outside, it would sound like, you know, you, uh, you, you, you wronged me somehow. You stole from me or you, you, you somehow sinned against me in, in some terrible way. I'm like, all right, we're going to make this right. Go get your cat. Bring it to my house. Shed its blood on my front yard. Why all this talk about shedding the blood The reason is that sin brings death and the life is in the blood. God said in Genesis, God who gave life as a free gift to everyone, God who gave life as a free gift to everyone said sin brings death, the cessation of life. 
And so it's not a surprise for us to read chapter 2, verse 1. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We've sinned, and so sin brings death, and we get that. Well, how will God make us alive? Well, somebody who's not dead needs to step into our death and take our death and give us his life. The only deathless one, the only Lord of life one that there is, is God himself, the Son of God, the second member of the eternal trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped in and took our death. And that's why it says he shed his blood. We were dead spiritually. Jesus died physically. Jesus was raised physically, chapter 1, verse 20. Jesus was raised physically so that we could be raised to newness of life spiritually, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. This all happens only if we're in Christ. And sometimes if we're honest, all this talk about blood, it almost sounds a little strange, but it makes sense. I mean, just look ahead to chapter 5, verse 2. Look ahead to Ephesians 5, verse uh, 2. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Even if you're here and you think, all this talk about blood sounds strange and weird. Let me tell you why it's not strange and not weird. Because you you already believe this. Love isn't love if it's just talk. I think everybody would agree with me about that. Love isn't love if it's just talk. Love doesn't talk. Love doesn't make excuses Love doesn't simply say, well, I wish, but there's nothing I could do about it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Love gives. If love doesn't give, it's not love. Christ gave himself for us. Chapter 5, verse 25. Verse 25 of chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love isn't love if it's just talk. Love is love if it gives. Well, what what is the ultimate gift that love can give? Itself. And so when Christ gave himself for us is when he shed his blood for us, is when his life was poured out for us. That's what makes this thing make sense. That's what happened at the cross. That's why the blood matters so much. It's not ghoulish. It's not vampirish. It's personal. It's saying my own life is what I love with because that's what love does. Seated us with him. Is it nice to be seated? You're seated. We, we Racine Bible Church used to meet downtown and we had wooden pews. They, the seats you have now are so way more comfortable than that. When... Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 is talking about uh, how safe our salvation is. It says, God raised you up with Christ and seated you with him in the heavenly places. This is, what does that mean? Just let's go back to, let's go back to the Olympics. You, if you knew someone who was competing in the Winter Olympics and you called them a year ago, your friend is trying to medal in an event in the Winter Olympics in Sochi and you called your friend a year ago, and said, how, how are you doing? What are you up to? And your friend's answer was, I'm just sitting around. I'm just chilling. I'm just relaxing. I'm not doing anything. Getting a lot of, getting a lot of use out of my Netflix. This is, this is not the response. But if you called, if your friend went to the Olympics, meddled, stood there while their anthem played, and then after the closing ceremonies, The day after the closing ceremonies, your friend invited you and all of his or her coaches. They had a big banquet and everyone is seated at the table. Your friend is wearing the medal around her neck or around his neck. You say, what are you doing? Well, I'm sitting here enjoying life. That's what this means. By grace, you've been saved, not by works. There's no way 
that the, the proper answer is, well, I'm working for it, I'm working for it, I'm working for it, and maybe it'll happen. This is saying if you're saved, you are already seated. You already got the perfect 10, you already got the gold medal, and you're already seated at the banquet with Christ. That's how secure salvation is. That's how complete salvation is. That's great news. That is great news. How is that salvation ours? Well, the answer to that, how it becomes ours, is simply right there in verses 8 and 9. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works. We know that salvation is through faith. We know this. When they asked the apostles in Acts, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's belief, it's faith. Faith means receiving something, not doing something. Salvation works through faith because faith is a receiving action. I like John Piper's definition of faith. Faith is unique among all the acts of the soul because it is the most empty-handed. It is all dependence upon another. In a sense, faith is an acted non-act an act that is entirely receiving. Faith is a doing whose doing is the will to let another do all the doing. You hear that? Faith is a doing uh, whose doing is a will to let another do all the doing on my behalf. And if I could give you one more, I've always loved A.W. Tozer's definition of faith. Faith is the least self-regarding of the virtues. By its very nature, it is scarcely conscious of itself. Like the eye, which sees everything in front of it and never sees itself. Faith is occupied with its object and pays no attention to itself. And then he ends with this. While we are looking at God, we do not see ourselves. Blessed riddance this. To see Christ with the eye of faith is to see everything that I need. The saving power of faith resides not in faith, but in the Almighty Savior who comes to us through faith. If you, if you wanted me to speak technically as a, as a, as a, as a theologian with a postgraduate degree, I would, I would have to say, it is not faith that saves. It is Jesus Christ who saves. And he saves through faith. It is not the strength of the faith which saves. It is the strength of the Savior who comes to us through faith, weak and reedy as it is. So this salvation that comes to us through faith is ours by grace. It's ours by grace. And you see the five phrases there in verses 8 and 9? And God uh, says it five times. Why does God say it five times? Not complicated. Have you, have you ever recently had to tell someone the same thing five times? Why did you recently have to tell someone the same thing five times? I know you don't want to say it in church, but the reason why is because the someone you were saying it to is a complete knucklehead. That's why you had to tell him it five times. And so God says five different ways. He says By grace you've been saved. And if you don't want to hear that because, well, you, God didn't do it all for you. You did some of it for yourself. Then if you don't hear that, he gives you the second phrase. This is not your own doing. And if you don't want to hear that because, well, I know God did most of it, but I did a little of it. And I did a, I did a little, God gave me a great gift, but I did a little of it. Then he tells you the third phrase. It is the gift of God. And if you can't accept that because, well, I know I did something myself, then he tells you a fourth time, not a result of works. And if you're still refusing to hear that because you're so wired to to want to perform and earn your own score, he tells you a fifth time so that no one can boast. You can't possibly boast in the score you got. It's only God. Why all five phrases, by grace you've been saved, this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. The reason he has to repeat it five times is because we all miss it one way or another. Either we refuse to believe verses one through three, 
And we're like, well, verses one through three talk about the really, really bad sinners on the other side of the tracks. They need 100% grace. But sinners like me, I need about 80 proof. because I got 20 on my own because I did some good stuff. Or we simply refuse to believe verses eight and nine because we say, yeah, you know, I, I need to be saved. I realize I'm a sinner, but I can do, I can get part of the way there myself. And we can't. Grace is mighty. Grace is free. Grace is unmerited. Grace is glorious. Grace is beautiful. But grace is humbling. Because if you're saved by grace, there's no way that you can boast. And if you will not be saved by grace, then you won't be saved at all. Because those who are saved can never boast. I think one reason we resist God's grace is because we are so addicted to our personal human distinctions. And grace levels all distinctions. And we don't like that. What what God's grace says, what Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10 say is this. There's no way I want you to misunderstand this. What Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says is that the most uh, morally upstanding exemplary member of this congregation and the most uh, morally scandalous, deplorable individual in all of southeastern Wisconsin are completely equal at the cross. And both of those persons needed exactly the same amount of grace. And God needed to be rich in mercy and abundant in grace to save the morally upstanding and the morally profligate individual. It did not require more grace for one than the other. It's all of grace. And if it is all of grace, then no one can boast, verse 9 and verse 7, God can be glorified. Human boasting is silenced so that divine praising can be amplified. Human boasting is silenced, verse 9, so that divine praise can be amplified, verse 7, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so you see how this all snaps together. Of course, the first point, our condition, leads to God having compassion on us. A compassion that is evident of the heart of God, that He is love. And if it's our condition of spiritual deadness and depravity and God's compassion, then that third point has to be the case that our salvation has to be by grace through faith, by grace. And that has to lead to the fourth that that verse 10 says, now we do good works. Now we do good works because he created those good works for us to walk in him. If salvation is all by grace, it's not by our works, then our good works have no place before conversion and our good works have a wonderful place after conversion. You see, because it's not by our works that we're saved, but once God saves us by His power, salvation is a change that brings changes. Salvation is a new life that brings with it a new walk. So all these good works are on this side of conversion. We do good works because salvation is not meaningless, because salvation is a real change that leads to real changes. But these good works we do by the power of God, by the Spirit of God, because Christ is in us. So even our good works are never a source of boasting. Even our good works, the good works that you do and work hard at, are just one more line in the great chorus of verse 7, that in the ages to come, the immeasurable riches of His grace may radiate out of your life of good works.
This is why the gospel of God is such good news. And this is why you've got to insist that whoever would share the gospel out of God's word would never be smart enough to edit God. It's all these things together. It's the reality of our condition and the reality of the gracious provision uh, uh, for us to be converted and to be saved. This is how God is glorified. This is how he's glorified because Jesus Christ took our place. By grace you've been saved and by grace he's raised you up and by grace he's seated you in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come he might show the incomparable riches of his grace toward us in Christ Jesus. In this God is glorified that in the, the crushing, condemning death of Jesus Christ on the cross, the mercy and grace of God flow like a mighty river into the lives of all those who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved by grace through faith. Let's pray. We bow for prayer. Ask you to take a moment to pray. If, um, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, you have been saved by grace through faith, and take a moment and pray a prayer of thanksgiving, glory, honor, to God who saved you by His grace. And if you have not yet been saved, I just ask you to cry out to God for His grace. Hear me. If you place some condition between Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, you'll never come. If you wait until you're ready, if you wait until you're sorry enough, if you wait until you clean up your act enough, you will never come. But I'm telling you, Christ isn't telling you to do something first and then come to him. Jesus Christ says, come to me now. Lord Jesus, have mercy on those who are gathered here. Oh, have mercy on those who have been converted by uh, filling their lives as a true song of praise to you for your grace. And Lord Jesus, have mercy on those who have not yet been converted by making today the day of their salvation. When they cry out to you, Lord Jesus, and you hear their cry, and in marvelous, bottomless mercy and grace, you pour that mercy out upon them. Lord Jesus, as your church exalts you as Savior, as we recount again the glories of your gospel, fill our minds and our hearts and our lips with praises to you because you are so merciful and have saved us by such marvelous, infinite grace. In Jesus' name, we pray and sing. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. In Christ alone, all our hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. 
cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love, and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost. It's grip on me, for I am His, and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, it's His power in us. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ. In me, from life's first try to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever fly me from his head till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his head Till he returns or oh, calls me home Here in the power of Christ I stand Church, this is a trustworthy, this is a trustworthy statement. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If you are His and He is yours, go in the power of that salvation, go in the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ alone. Amen.